The Big Bang Theory, a cosmological model that describes the creation of the universe, has been a cornerstone of our understanding of the cosmos for decades. However, as technology evolves, so does our understanding of this important event. The latest tool to aid in this exploration is the James Webb Space Telescope, JWST, which is altering our understanding of the Big Bang Theory and our origins. JWST's capacity to explore the universe at infrared wavelengths has opened up new paths of research in cosmology. Scientists are now able to gaze further back in time to observe the first galaxies that formed in the early universe with a level of precision that was previously inconceivable. This has enabled researchers to dive deeper into the secrets of the universe, finding new insights about the Big Bang and the early universe. In other words, it's time to re-examine the Big Bang theory. Join us today as we go deep into how the James Webb Space Telescope just appended our knowledge of the cosmos. Perhaps the biggest success of late 20th and early 21st century astrophysics is the emergence of a consensus model of the entire universe, the Lambda Cold Dark Matter, Lambda CDM, cosmology. For endless generations, humanity has marveled at questions such as what the cosmos is, what makes it up, how far its limits extend, how it came into being, how long ago, how it evolved to its current state, and what its ultimate fate will be. Today, after extraordinary observations of galaxies across cosmic history, full-sky imaging of the cosmos at microwave wavelengths, and countless transient events all around the universe, we finally have answers. Our universe is constituted of 68% dark energy, 27% dark matter, and just 5% conventional matter. It all began from a compact, dense, nearly perfectly uniform state some 13.8 billion years ago in a blazing Big Bang and has been expanding, cooling, and gravitating ever since. At least, that's the consensus picture. Recently, however, a challenge to that picture has garnered some rather public attention. Based on the newest findings from the James Webb Space Telescope, whose extraordinary infrared eye has been rewriting what we thought we knew about the early cosmos, Astronomers have long considered that the newly minted galaxies immediately after the Big Bang were too frail to boast any recognizable structures. However, the latest study suggests that these fragile forms could have appeared as early as 3.7 billion years after the Big Bang, almost at the beginning of the universe. According to Christopher Consolas, an astronomy professor at the University of Manchester in the UK and a co-author of the new study, Astronomers must rethink our understanding of the formation of the first galaxies and how galaxy evolution occurred over the past 10 billion years. The new findings come on the heels of another announcement presented by a different group of researchers, also based on JWST data, which showed that these early galaxies produced far fewer heavy elements than previously expected. However, the relationship between a galaxy's chemical makeup and its evolution into a well defined structure is not well known. Much of scientists' previous understanding of galaxy evolution came from data obtained by the Hubble Space Telescope, which is legendary in its own right but still has limitations. While the Hubble data showed early galaxies had irregular shapes as was predicted during galaxy mergers, higher resolution data from the JWST is delving further into the universe to find that those early galaxies actually had well defined structures like our own Milky Way. The latest findings were based on an investigation of 3,956 galaxies from the early universe, the largest sample investigated so far with JWST data. According to Leonardo Farah, an astrophysicist at the University of Victoria in British Columbia, Canada, and the lead author of the new study, for over 30 years, it was thought that these disk galaxies were rare in the early universe due to common violent encounters that galaxies undergo. The fact that JWST finds so many is another sign of the power of this instrument and that the structures of galaxies from earlier in the universe, much earlier in fact than anyone had anticipated. According to the new study, the scientists classified the sample set of close to 4,000 galaxies from the early universe by shape, like disks, point sources, and spheroids. Team members further classified them as smooth or structured with galaxies in the latter group showing bursts of star formation and evidence of merges with other galaxies. Results demonstrated that very well-defined structures in the universe form a lot quicker than previously thought, following what is known as the Hubble sequence, b 
the usual classification of galaxies by their optical features as elliptical, lenticular, and spirals. The recent discoveries reveal a need for new ideas that explain how galaxies formed over the past 10 billion years, and it wasn't something scientists really expected. But the mainstream model of the world in cosmology just became much more falsified as we evaluated JWST's past discoveries. Not only is the James Webb Space Telescope seeing galaxies growing 2 to 500 million years after the Big Bang, but also that they are bigger and brighter than astronomers thought. As a quick remark, the farthest galaxies viewed by the telescope are also some of the earliest galaxies in our universe. The Webb Telescope can see them because it is picking up the feeble light emitted by them. By the time the light from these great reaches of the universe approaches the telescope, it is in the infrared region of light and no longer accessible to the naked eye. This light has been traveling a long time. For reference, it takes roughly 8 minutes for light to travel from the sun to your eye. Light from Proxima Centauri, the nearest stellar neighbor of the sun, takes a little over 4 years to reach us here on Earth. But light is a double-edged sword in the context of these galaxies. It's what helps us study the galaxies, but there's so much more of it than scientists would have thought. The brightness of a galaxy can be attributed to its mass, because a galaxy's light comes from stars. If you assume a given average brightness and mass of a star, you may roughly estimate the mass of a galaxy. But much of the modeling astronomers have done up to this point has led them to assume that there wasn't enough time for galaxies to get this massive in such a short time. As Georges Marino, an associate professor of astronomy at Pomona College, said, it's like if you went to a kindergarten and you saw a teenager. The high level of structure and brightness in these galaxies is driving some astrophysicists to question the age of the universe. How ancient is our universe? The question is simple enough, but as the years go by, it's becoming evident that settling on an answer isn't quite so straightforward. Even now, the matter remains up to controversy, as fresh study could at any moment append our previous understanding. In an attempt to explain the stunningly brilliant, highly structured, and probably extremely large galaxies occurring so early in the timeline of the cosmos, a researcher has hypothesized that the universe is nearly twice as old as previously believed. This researcher and others stretched the age of the universe from a spry 13.8 billion years old to around 26.7 billion years old. Well, let's look at these two hypotheses side by side and dissect what's true versus what would need to be true in order to truly estimate the age of the universe. First one, it's worth remembering that any time you are offered a scientific hypothesis, you have to ask yourself what assumptions are behind it. In the case of the standard model of cosmology, the Lambda CDM model, the assumptions are that the rules of physics are given by general relativity for gravity and the standard model of particle physics for the other three fundamental forces. The cosmos is basically the same in all directions, isotropic, and the same at all locations, homogeneous, if you view it on the biggest cosmic scales. In addition to the known particles that make up our conventional notions of matter and radiation, there also exists some form of dark matter and some form of dark energy, both of which contribute to the universe's expansion. Dark matter not only aids in but dominates the formation of large-scale structure within general relativity and particle physics. However, there are some unstated assumptions that are so fundamental to these theories that they're never even talked about, that the underlying laws of physics are the same everywhere and at all times, that the fundamental constants are truly constant, and that the only effect empty space has on light that passes through it is on its light's wavelength through a combination of the Doppler shift due to relative velocity, gravitational redshift due to the curvature of spacetime, and cosmological redshift due to the expansion of the universe. On the other hand, the new hypothesis put forth by controversial physicist Rajender Gupta retains most of the same assumptions in place, but adds a few tiny but essential alterations. First, instead of assuming that only the Doppler shift, the relative motions of the light-emitting source and the light-absorbing observer, the gravitational shift, the difference in the spacetime curvature between the emitting source and the absorbing observer, and the cosmological shift as the traveling light gets stretched to longer wavelengths by the expanding spacetime, it's traveling through. Gupta also proposes an idea first put forth by noted astronomer Fritz Zwicky back in 1929, the 
tired light hypothesis, or the notion that light, as it travels through space, inherently radiates and loses energy as it travels, becomes tired before it arrives at the observer. And second, instead of the standard assumption that the laws of physics and the fundamental constants behind them are constant with time, Gupta invokes an assumption that others have explored previously, that the fundamental constants like the speed of light, Planck's constant, and backslash, g backslash, the gravitational constant, aren't actually constant in time but vary. In particular, they vary in a special way, changing altogether so that the combinations of these constants that govern atomic transitions and emission absorption lines that we wind up observing won't change as we look to either more distant galaxies within the expanding universe. But there are critical pieces of evidence that would show up if either light became fatigued as it traveled through the universe and or if the fundamental constants have altered as the universe has evolved. They would show up in incredibly telling ways, and we could actually list a couple of them off, before looking at the evidence that the cosmos itself presents on these fronts. Here are four of the most major ones. 1. Fatigued light would provide a blurring effect to faraway galaxies. When Zwicky first introduced the tired light theory in 1929, it was one of the few astronomical ideas that wasn't practical even at the moment it was proposed. The reason Zwicky himself recognized, even prior to publishing the idea, that if there was something causing the light to get tired, i.e., something for it to interact with that caused it to lose energy, then more distant objects wouldn't just appear redder as their light lost energy, which would boost it to longer wavelengths, but would also appear blurrier. In fact, those more distant objects would be obscured by a greater amount than observations would have permitted. Yet, in this as well as other photos that show proximate and high redshift objects together, no such blurring has ever been observed. The universe doesn't get blurrier the farther back we look. The optical limits of modern telescopes and observatories show that well. 100% of the observed redshift is cosmological tired light would abolish cosmological time dilation. 2. Here's a reality that we don't frequently think about. The more redshifted an object's light is, the more time it takes for the same number of emitted wavelengths to be seen by the distant observer. An object at a redshift of backslash z equals 1 backslash would have its wavelength stretched by 100% over an object that was in the here and now at a redshift of backslash z equals 0 backslash. In order for the same number of crests and troughs of the wave to pass us by, because they only arrive half as frequently, we'd have to wait twice as long. This comes in a very fascinating inference that when we look out at the distant, high redshift universe, we should notice those distant things exhibit a cosmological time dilation, where their clocks appear to run slow from our perspective. We've seen this for a range of cosmic objects, including for distant supernovae, where the more redshifted a supernova is, the more its light curve becomes stretched out in time. This was recently confirmed at greater redshift by looking at a class of objects, quasars, that appear to tick with a regular periodicity going all the way back to when the universe was under 1 billion years old. 100% of the redshift again appears to be cosmological, and these quasars show a time dilation of exactly the amount predicted by our standard lambda CDM cosmology, with no difference observed. 3. None of the redshift can be chalked up to tired light. Tired light would modify the thermal blackbody spectrum of the cosmic microwave background. This is a very, very big one. Whereas the galaxies we're looking at go up to a modest redshift of backslash, z equals 13 backslash, which is where the current cosmic record holder presently sits, the cosmic microwave background was emitted back at a whopping redshift of backslash, z equals 1089 backslash when the universe was only 380,000 years old. According to the standard Lambda CDM model, when light redshifts due to cosmological expansion, it maintains its blackbody character, the spectrum of how photons are distributed remains in thermal equilibrium. The number density of photons, however, has to drop to match that of a cooler blackbody, and in the Lambda CDM, it does. But if light were to get tired instead, the energy of the individual photons that compose the cosmic microwave background would still drop, but the number density wouldn't change. As a result, the spectrum of tired light that appears as a cosmic background would not obey a blackbody spectrum, and yet the cosmic microwave background is the most preferred blackbody ever measured. 
The only way to save this aspect of tired light cosmology would be to observe some sort of non-blackbody component to the cosmic microwave background, but to date, none has ever been observed. 4. Evolving coupling constants wouldn't just affect the distant universe, but would manifest in laboratory tests here on Earth. But there's an independent set of constraints we can put on Gupta's second idea, the notion that the coupling constants change over time. Atomic transitions are governed by changes in two of the fundamental constants, C and H, the speed of light and Planck's constant, while cosmological changes are sensitive to backslash, G backslash, the gravitational constant, as well as backslash, C backslash, and backslash, H backslash. But on Earth, we have independent ways to check these constants, independently. Including how they've evolved over time. While laboratory measurements of the electron magnetic moment, the spin flip transition of hydrogen, and the equivalent of inertial to gravitational mass all provide good constraints, we have a far stronger one that proves the constancy of these fundamental constants over time Earth's only natural nuclear reactor. By looking at how the nuclear reactions occurred under the natural conditions that existed on Earth 1.7 billion years ago, we can determine that the fine structure constant, which depends on the electron charge, the speed of light, and Planck's constant, changes by less than 0.3 parts in backslash, 10 carat, 16, backslash, per year. That constraint is quite literally billions of times stronger than what Gupta's varying fundamental constant explanation would require. It is for these reasons, among others, that we can overwhelmingly conclude that even if Gupta's toy model of the universe may be entertaining to play with, it has no validity in reality as far as either weary light or covariant basic constants are concerned. Observations of the universe from in-focus faraway galaxies to cosmologically time-dilated events to a blackbody cosmic microwave background spectrum to nuclear reactors right here on Earth all reveal that these theories do not correlate to our actual world. It might be enjoyable to investigate or think about, but at the end of the day, the cosmos is our laboratory, and whatever it reveals to us about how nature actually acts is what we have to deal with. The cosmos might not be fully understood, but its age is undoubtedly 13.8 billion years old and absolutely cannot be 26.7 billion years old, based on the facts at hand. Well, that's all the information we have for you today. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you loved today's episode, subscribe if you haven't already, and click that bell so you never miss out on future episodes. Be sure to tell us what you think about today's content. Everyone's support drives us to continue offering outstanding material and to continually improve. As always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.